Our guest panelist began his career as Nori Paramore's assistant at EMI Records, where he helped to shape the career of uh, Cliff Richard in the Shadows, Helen Shapiro, and many others. He's uh, written a number of top ten hits, including Helen Shapiro's Walking Back to Happiness, which won him and co-writer Mike Hawker an Ivor Novello Award, which is the highest award that a songwriter can get. Um, He's known as one of the great A&R men, a producer, a songwriter. He's uh, been credited with bringing Motown to the U.K. It's my extreme pleasure to welcome John Schroeder. John, sir, it's, it's great to have you on the show with us today. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really pleased to be here. I have such a good that too. Fantastic, Bruce. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, you know, uh, it's true. You, you've been in the business uh, a while. You, you know your way around the block. Um, you know, why don't you fill our, our viewers in on some of the, the things you've been involved with? Well, I've been in the British music industry for over 40 years now. I started with EMI Records in 1957. And uh, you're quite right. I've worked with Cliff Richard, um, Shadows, and Harry Shapiro. Uh, who uh, I found and discovered in uh, 13 and a half years old and um, wrote most of her hit songs, uh, particularly Talking About to Happen, which was on the album of Bellamore, which was the best song of the year in 61. Uh, I then left EMI Records and joined a little company called Oil Records, where I wanted to dine very broadly and managed to consummate the distribution rights for the Channel of Motown Yes, we put out a whole pile of records which nobody wanted to know about. We couldn't get any play on them, radio play on them, or anything. They were way, they were way before their time. But uh, those two years were an incredible experience. Some, some fantastic artists, fantastic talent, which I knew one day would break. Of course, unfortunately, after two years, uh, with our first hit, which was Stevie Wonder's Infinity Part 2, we lost the contract to EMI, and for well, the rest is history. They they put out my guy uh, very well, and there's what else. But uh, firstly, I'm very thrilled to have uh, a met very broadly and consummated that deal. Following that, I joined Pi Records uh, and was with Pi for eight years, and and produced Status Quo and many many other artists. In fact, dare I say, I produced 170. My career. Um, at the moment, sorry, at the moment I've just written a book and um, putting all that on, you know, on, on paper, and uh, I hope that there are a lot of people get things out of reading about it. Yeah, let's tell everybody a little bit about your book. Uh, I, I want to make sure that everybody can hear you all right, so I'm going to ask if you can uh, just to, to speak up a little bit, maybe move a little bit closer to the camera, But uh, because you know the, what you're telling us is fascinating information, and uh, your career has been an amazing career. And, uh, you know, uh, in fact, uh, you, I guess, are the father of Motown over there in the U.K., basically. Now you were you were also involved in uh, your own group, you know, instrumental instrumental uh, outfit called Sounds Orchestral. Uh, you had uh, a hit with uh, "Cast Your Fate to the Wind," which was used in uh, a movie deal in a movie series. As a matter of fact, the Ocean's Eleven series, if I'm not mistaken, is that correct, sir? Um, no, uh, not quite. No, it's uh, one of the tracks. Uh, I recall it was used in the ocean. That they, okay. It, uh, it, it wasn't the sounds of orchestral, it was another orchestral com- uh, combination I have. But the um, con- sounds of orchestral is perhaps one of the biggest achievements of my career. And I really wanted to bring orchestral music nearer to the understanding of the young generation. And I knew it could only be done through the media of a hit record. And for three years I was looking for a piece of material. And by chance, I discovered Master Fate to the Wind, which was a jazz record uh, written and recorded by Vince Guaraldi, who was a out there in San Francisco, I believe. And I made a sketch of that too, and uh, put together South Orchestral. I found it and, uh, well, 
uh, we have actually made 17 albums since that success. It was a hit in every country of the world, dare I say, and won me the uh, best instrumental. And then they make awards for the best instrumental record in Great Britain in the world. Well, that's so, uh, now, you, you've written a book. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your book? Um, I know that, uh, well, in fact, I don't know much about it. I think Ian is the one who introduced it to me. So I'll let you, the man who wrote it, uh, introduce it to everybody. Well, let's put it this way. I didn't want to write this book. I really was asked by all the people around me and friends that I should write the book because what I have done through my 40 years in the British Visionary should be documented. And, uh, once I sort of got to grips with actually doing it, and I really got into it and didn't realize the amount of artists that I've actually produced uh, being 170. The book is called Sex and Violins. Um, there it is. Uh, it's available through Amazon, and I'm uh, doing lots of interviews and things on it. It uh, tracks my career from how I got into the music industry throughout all the years in it, uh, and needless to say, it portrays the, the failures as well as the successes. It's written more as a novel than an autobiography, so I hope the, uh, uh, the reader really gets into what it, the feel of the music industry was like at that period of time. Now, as a, as a gentleman who's been in the music industry for 40 plus years, uh, how have you seen the industry change since the time you started in it in, until today? Well, I don't think that today's music industry is as exciting as the industry of the 60s and 70s. In fact, I'm really, really lucky to have made my success, if you know, my greatest success during the 60s and 70s. Because such emotion, such fuel, so many things were happening in the music industry changes a new technology, technology and all sorts of things that don't seem to happen today. You know, and there's this uh, reason is so dissected today and technically, 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 side of it is so advanced. I think in those days, the thrill of producing a hit record is far greater than it is today. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I think, uh, do you, now, how would you compare... Uh, and this may be a, an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How would you compare the artists that you've worked with uh, from the 60s and 70s to today's artists that you, you've seen and may have worked with? Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with all the artists that are around today, but I do keep in touch with a lot of things. And uh, there's certain artists that I say to myself, well, I would love to have produced her. And someone like Leona Lewis is an example. I would love to produce that girl. And there are various others. But um, again, I think uh, the 60s had so much talent. And it was such a exciting industry. I, I think it's incomparable uh, with today's industry. And um, I think that you know, everything in music has a place. And uh, you know, I, I admire what goes on today as well. I listen to everything. I'm thrilled that I actually I had my success during the 60s. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, John. Remember, uh, John is a, uh, a great A&R man, a producer, a songwriter as well. He's an Ivor Novello Award winner along with Mike Hawker for writing uh, Walking Back to Happiness, which was uh, a hit for Helen Shapiro, uh, sold over a million records. Uh, and, a, and a great song to boot. He's also an author of Sex and Violins. And, uh, John, it's great to have you back with us. Thanks so much for being here again. Fantastic being here. Great to see you all again. We're, we're just happy to have you. Now, I know that uh, you're currently working on some projects with, uh, with Sam Kelly. And uh, what was the name of the band again, Ian's? Samandi. Samandi. Well, I never. I see it here in front of me. I just don't know how it's pronounced. Samandi. So you're you're actually uh, helping produce or producing that album. I'm actually producing it. I produced them in uh, the early seventies. We made three albums. Sam Kelly is actually the drummer of the band. Um, quite a prolific character as well. He's, uh, he's a lot of session work at the moment, but. 
the band have quite a fan following. We got a top 20 single in the States in the 70s called The Message. Uh, the band actually toured America with Al Green. Mm -hmm. And they also did a tour on their, in, in their own right in America. And we played um, Harlem and uh, it was, we had a fantastic time. And now uh, there is a, a demand for another album, and um, I'm getting together with the guy. Well, they're not playing together; they they are around together, and um, I'm pre doing pre production work with them at the moment on uh, 12, 12 tracks, which we hope to record in July. Excellent. Well, we wish you the best of luck on that. I know that uh, Sam is uh, is going to be a guest panelist on the broadcast uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, hopefully uh, you're going to be able to tell us a story or two we can, we can use for him so we can talk about him and make him laugh and feel a little uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, you can, maybe you and Ian can exchange stories on Sam offline because, you know, we don't want to put you on the spot or anything. But I do know that, you know, from reading your, uh, your profile that we have up on our site, that you're one of the guys, you're the, the guy, in fact, that was credited with uh, bringing Motown over to, to the UK. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I was um, the label manager for a small record company called Oriel Records, and it was the only independent British record company at the time. And uh, Maurice Levy, who owned that company, wanted to put it up against the majors. And... Uh, uh, institute a really proper label with uh, artists and all that and I started signing British artists but I felt that we needed American product and I noticed that in the American charts the cash box top 100 mainly there, were, there was a label getting a lot of hits all the time at Tamla Motown and uh, they hadn't actually got any distribution in the UK at the time and so I got to Maurice Levy to find out who the president of um, the Motown was, Barry Gordy, and uh, asked him if he'd like to come over to England and, uh, you know, we could talk about distribution. And uh, I wined and dined Barry Gordy at the Talk of the Town in London. Um, and he had uh, Barney Ells with him, his personal assistant and so on. And uh, from that meeting, we managed to consummate the uh, distribution deal for the Tamla Motown label for two years. Well, that's amazing. Which was a hell of a... Well, it was a hell of a struggle because no one wanted to play that product. All British radio stations didn't want to know about it because it was, they didn't understand it, actually. That was the whole problem. No, I understand. Uh, it's just amazing that, uh, you know, you actually picked up on, on what nobody else did. Well, I did because I was very, uh, at the moment, I was very concerned with uh, Liverpool and uh, the band recording bands in Liverpool. And they heard, the Liverpool bands heard this product coming from over from America because Liverpool's a port in the north of England. And so they knew this product. But um, the radio stations didn't. And they didn't, they didn't want to know about it. And it took two years before we actually got our first hitch, which was Stevie Wonder's Fingertips Part 2. And that was the one and only hit we had. And then, unfortunately, our two-year contract period was up, and we lost the uh, the rights to EMI. And well, the rest is history because they EMI came through with Mary Wells and the Contours and God knows what after that. Right. It was sort of. But you, I, you opened the door. And then I opened the door, and I like to feel, although it's frustrating, I like to feel that it was it was an honour really to have um, done business and met Barry Gordy and actually. Uh, helped to institute uh, the Tamla Motown label in England at that time. So uh, you're actually, I guess, would be conservative, conservatively called the godfather of Motown in the UK. Mm, well, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, I, think that's a, I think that's fair. I think that really is. Now, uh, John used to go around uh, leaving horses' heads in people's beds if they didn't buy his records. I was just about to say, what is that, a little too close to the truth there? No, no. <laughs> Play this record, Morel. Now, uh, <laughs> Sex and Violins, your book, uh, let everybody know a little bit of what it is about. Because, uh, you know, well, I'm, I'm just going to let you tell the story. Well, it, it is an autobiography, but uh, the title, Sex and Violins, describes what I feel about music. To me, music, or the music that I've made particularly, which covers a multitude of sins including a lot of orchestral music is is 
is music is sexual music um, and sex meaning whatever you want it to mean. It can mean romance, it can be love, it can be anything you want it to mean. And I think music is all about uh, love and romance and sex. And and, um, and that is what I felt I made. And uh, Sex and Violins is an autobiography as such, I suppose. Um, I've written the book myself, it's not ghost-written, and it portrays the highs and the lows of my career, the tragedies and the success, because the tragedy is much as part of the success of trying to attain those hit records. What it was like with record companies in the 1960s through the 70s and uh, the competition and uh, the incredible excitement about the industry, which I think the industry does not have today, by the way, for me, and um, I think the book the book tells a lot of facts, but it tells them in a very uh, you know one to one way as i 'm talking to you now of what the industry was like in those days and uh, I surprised myself with a memory that I have actually produced no less than one hundred and seventy artists during my career wow. in the music industry, which spans forty years. Uh, but uh, I was a How may I repeat of, that number again, could you please? 170, 170, and they're My all God, listed in the book. Congratulations! <laughs> they're listed I in the book out of the record labels. <laughs> now, right. the, the 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 and then that, that that number is a huge number of artists. Um, now, when if people want to get a copy of your book, uh, they can go to your website, right? Uh, and order it there. Jsentltd dot com. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, the best place probably is Amazon. Okay, it's available. It's Amazon. Amazon is, yes, Amazon is universal or global or anything. And the book is uh, on Amazon. Uh, it's got a, I think it's got a very good write up on Amazon as well. Uh, there, dare I say? So yeah, uh, yeah actually, I think I'm Amazon actually reading the book. I'm actually reading the book as we speak, and it's it's a very interesting read. Uh, That's you know, lots about lots about girls in toilets and smoking, and uh, while at a boys' school and. <laughs> And things like that, and, and old cars, as well as music. It's a very good read. Thank you, Ian. It's about music. <laughs> <laughs> what, it, what, it, what it took to make music in those days. Yeah. There is it's about girls in toilets and smoking and getting caught with them and stuff. Like, there is bits. I see. <laughs> it's, 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 it sounds to me like a fascinating book. I wish you well with the book, obviously, uh, and, and the album with Samandi as well. And so, uh, what's next on your list of things to do? What What are you going to do uh, next, blowing the world wide open once again? Well, in actual fact, I've written a second book. Um, and it's nothing to do with music whatsoever. Um, it's actually, uh, it is published, or will be published and released in September. Uh, it's called Cozy Cats Cottage PLC, and it's a story about cats. I cats I've had cats all my life and uh, it's what they get up to in this book of uh, from a therapeutic point of view and it's a young lady who experiences uh, with her mother who is deaf and blind and uh, one of her cats uh, one, uh, jumps up on his lap and although he can't see or hear he, he puts a smile on his face for the next uh, for following three years and she forms a company called Cozy Cats Cottage PLC and actually employs six cats that she sends out on therapeutic errands to uh, children's nurseries, or handicapped children, um, terminal ill people. You know, it's, it, it's a novel and all the cats talk in it as well. Fascinating. It's quite fun. That sounds like a great book. Well, as I say, it's uh, cats, dogs and cats, I think, uh, are the two animals that are loved universally all over the world. And, uh, uh, and it's a very fun, um, amusing, loving little story about what cats are able to do well, in, it, the, in the world we live in. Yeah, it sounds great. It sounds great. Look forward to that. That's coming out uh, in September. So uh, yes. uh, everybody should be able to, to find that, hopefully, on Amazon or your website as well. And uh, again, that website, John, is J-S-E-N-T-L-T-D, John Schroeder Entertainment Limited, I believe is what that stands for. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Dot C-O dot U-K, yeah. Okay. That's right. I, I was looking at it more as Jay sent it. 
It, <laughs> what? I have no idea. Tom, Tom does his no, own No, no, I was saying this, if you jumble everything together and try to pronounce it as a word, it, it could be pronounced as j sent it. Okay. Eccentric. Okay. <laughs> no, well, you could be eccentric, but I'm saying sent it. Oh. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, as now Just, I've wasted uh, 30 seconds. I'm sure I'll get whipped by Richie later well, on. Well, uh, you will. You will. So well, I've I been having a dinner guest who stuck around for the show. Excellent. Mr. John Schroeder, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Well, nice to have John with us. John, good to have hello, you. Hello, John. I'm well pleased to be here. I have done this before, but not like this. I've never had the privilege of being actually next to Ian in his company in his <laughs> own house. So this is a real pleasure. He's been played by my little boy and my little girl screaming. It's been yes. great for him. Yeah. <laughs> John, just wait until he sends you the bill. Oh, yeah, tell me about that. He did so, for me that he was going to do that. So. I'm signing his contracts. He's signing my invoice. It's, just, it's quite simple. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> uh, these studios don't come cheap, you know, boys. There you mm. are. That's true. So uh, I, I know that you and John have had a lot of opportunity to uh, sit and talk today. So uh, what were some of the things you talked about, Ian? What, uh, what happened? And uh, maybe you and John could uh, bring us up to speed. Well, let's, let's, for those that don't know John, John is an uh, Ivan Novello award winning songwriter for Walking Back to Happiness with Helen Shapiro, has produced for Status Quo, Cliff Richard, is an artist in his own right with sounds orchestral, had number one with Cast Your Fate to the Wind, was it? Not number one, number three. Number three. And, but has, you know, has been worked with, worked on number one songs and, and is generally an all round decent geezer. Yeah, thank and, you very uh, much. So that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you can pay me for that one later yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, so we've been talking about Sir Mandy earlier, haven't we, which is your current project. Mm, yeah. Do you want to fill everyone in a little on that? Well, Sir Mandy are, uh, or were a nine-piece black band, um, soul band. Um, and uh, 1972, I signed them to my record label, Alaska Records, and uh, we ended up making three albums. Um, the first album made the American top 50, and uh, we had a top 20 charts in America called The Message. Um, the group themselves actually uh, were toured America with um, Al Green uh, and then they went to America for another tour in their own right and uh, th this happened in the 70s. They've created quite a fan following over the years and um, now I'm in the studio with them after all this time um, making a fourth album. 40 years, isn't it? Yeah, it is 40 years ago. Um, yeah, 35, 40 years ago that we were actually in the studio doing those past albums. And it's because there's a demand um, for them and so on, and, uh, you know, that we've decided to put our heads together with new material and get back into the studio and produce a fourth album. Uh, but it's very strange, actually, producing this album today because of the world of digital and the world of analog. And in, in the 70s, you know... We these albums were produced with an analog concept, and um, a lot of the, the 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 infectious of this band happened in the studio. And uh, but today, you know, everything is sort of recorded digitally, and it's dissected, and you start losing a lot of the natural feelings. I think within the group, and uh, somehow I had to try and find a compromise, and it's not easy. Um, I found it, finding it very difficult. I'm working with two engineers, the one that produced the three al albums, so he's very conversant with the analog aspect of it, and the other engineer who is working with Pro Tools, which is the, you know, the digital aspect of it. But the idea is to produce um, a new piece of product that doesn't forsake the old image, but is enhanced by the new. Yeah. That is the ultimate mm -hmm. um, hope that we want to achieve. And we've actually produced five tracks and I'm very excited about them. We've got another uh, five or six to do. Uh, it's taking a long time, but um, that's how it is. You know, the band are not together either, which is very difficult working with a band who don't play together. Um, but they've all come together in the studio to do this project. But it's not easy. I'm finding it very, very hard. But it's very good for me. It stimulates my uh, creative juices, if you like. 
And you're working with Sam Kelly, of course, who's another guest on MSI. Yeah, Sam Kelly is a drummer, and uh, also he's done a lot of session work since Samandi. He started with Samandi in the early days, and that's all he knew knew what to do playing drums. But now he's sort of progressed dynamically. And I'm asking him to play drums like he did 40 years ago. And he said, what? He said, I don't know how to do that. You know, <laughs> it's just too conversant with, uh, you know, professional drumming today. And uh, it was difficult for him. Mm. Anyway. Uh, what, what dirt can you give us on Sam? Come on, some story of old. Sorry? There must be a story of old on Sam that you can tell us. Come on, dish the dirt, John. Not really, no. no. Sam, just a nice guy. <laughs> oh. you know, I, I play drums, man. This is Genuinely I disappointed do. here, yes. you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I talk to Sam on a regular basis. I'd yeah. like to know the dirt, you know. Well, ask him. <laughs> <laughs> tell you. Or, or read your book, eh? I'll read my book, yes. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about the books as well. You've got a, a couple of books out at the moment. You've got Sex and Violins, which we talked about well, before. Sex and Violins has been out about two years now. Um, it's available on Amazon. I've done lots and lots of radio interviews on it and book signings and so on. And obviously, it's an autobiography, but it is is written by myself. A lot of autobiographies are not. And um, it was really written under persuasion, really, by friends of mine who said, John, you've got to write to your story. Uh, what you've done is a part of the history of British pop music. And um, sadly... Uh, my wife at the time was very, very ill, and I'd been 24-hour caring for seven years, and she died of cancer last year, and um, the, writing that book kept me sane, actually, and uh, I, I relived everything I'd done in the music industry, how I got into the music industry, what I'd done in the industry, and the artists I produced. I have, in fact, produced 170 artists in the 40 years that I've been in the music industry. And I have um, a very, very good memory of practically every single session I've done. I think I wouldn't have been able to write the book without a memory. And there were the highs and there's the lows, a lot of tragedy involved in there. And there's a lot of funny parts in there as well. A lot of funny parts too, yeah. Because you were a bit of a lad, weren't you? You got up to a few bits and pieces like smoking in toilets and with young ladies and just things like should that, we talk yeah. about this little things. No, no, well, <laughs> i could talk about that but uh but you've also you've got another book out which is fiction which isn't anything to do with music but do you want to give us a quick rundown on the on the cat nothing to do with music at all it's to do with uh, cats um uh pussy cats and i've had cats all my life and so on they've been my parents had cats and i had cats and i don't know and i found them to be very therapeutic putic animals and it was through an incident uh, with my father who died at 94 years old but he was deaf and blind and confined to a wheelchair and then one day one of my mother's cats jumped up on his lap and uh, just uh, he factually fell out of the wheelchair but his hands went down to that cat he started kneading it and all the stress and anxiety went from his face and that cat and him were inseparable for three years and in my story um, it's about a young lady who happens ha that happens to her father. So she decides to form a company, and she calls it uh, Cozy Cat's Cottage PLC. And the PLC, in her mind, uh, stands for Pussy Loving Care. And what she does, she employs six cats, and she sends them out on missions of mercy. They go to uh, terminally ill people, they go to children, and the cats all talk in the book. They talk between each other as what it's like being employed and and how they and all the stories and little situations they get up to during uh, the course of the book, it's also illustrated uh, and it's been out now four months. Four months, and I have to say I've done a little bit of work with John on the book and the illustrations uh, who were done by uh, Kieran Ahmed, a young lady called Kieran Ahmed. Oh, just Brilliant. absolutely fantastic! Really, really nicely illustrated. Mm. The front cover. It's amazing. Um, it's, it's actually taken from a photograph of a cat called Pumpkin that I found in a national newspaper about 30 years ago. And it's the expression of the look. He's got his paw on his chin and he's sort of thinking. And <laughs> it's an amazing picture. And I and decided to use that picture for the front cover of the book. And Kieran managed to illustrate it absolutely amazingly. And it really is good. I'm, I'm really proud of the book, actually. And it's available on Amazon. It's available through Amazon. As a Kindle. Yes, Kindle, yeah. and uh, yeah, and it's just, um, I'm involved with the promotion of it at the moment, of doing book signings and radio things on it and so on, but um, 
it's extraordinary. The world of cats is incredible. There are nine million cat lovers. And uh, I remember just diverting for a minute. I did a book signing and spent 10 or 12 minutes talking to a couple of guys who came in about the book and so on. And they, they listened to me while I spilled on about how this book was written all this. And at the end of it, they both looked at me and said, we hate cats. We love dogs. <laughs> and I, I was totally speechless. I'd had 12 minutes talking about cats. We hate cats. We love dogs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh. You know what they say, you yeah. know, you know what uh, you dogs say? have masters, but cats have staff. <laughs> there uh, you go. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I must admit, I'm a dog man, personally. Oh, yeah. I, I could have, no, I'm not even well, going to go there, actually. I'm going to I'm gonna leave that one well alone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pussy lover myself. Going. That's the one. Yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> I wasn't going to go there, John. You just took it down right. the gutter, man. I well, just didn't expect whatever. that from you. <laughs> talked about knobs and things before. What are you talking about? Knobs and pussy. We've covered yeah, it all. Right. We're doing yep, well yep, tonight, yep. ladies yep. and gentlemen. Send your cards and letters to. Yeah, complaints to Rich Wildman. No, and... no, no, no. No, no, no. We're gonna <laughs> use the international post, folks. <laughs> well, Let's, uh, it's anniversary year for you um, this year. 50 years of Helen Shapiro's Walking Back to Happiness, which you co-wrote with Mike Hawker. Hawker. Mm. Uh, number one, I have an available award winning mm. for you. Yeah. Uh, but it's a big year, 50 years, but there's also a bit mm. of a flip side to this, isn't there, John? Well, there is, yes. I mean, Helen Shapiro, I discovered her um, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and um, she was 13 and a half years old. In fact, actually, it was... At the time, Brenda Lee was very big, and uh, we hadn't got an answer to Brenda Lee. So I suppose you could say, in a way, that uh, Helen Shapiro was Britain's answer to Brenda Lee, if you like. But she was 13 and a half years old, and for six months, we couldn't find a song for her because no one wrote songs for someone of 13 and a half years old. And actually, um, my boss, Nori Paramore, uh, said to me, he said, Look, we're going to. Uh, we're going to lose this artist unless we come up with a song for her. I said, uh, you know, why don't you think of something, John? Couldn't you write something for her? And I thought, well, what do children, uh, you know, girls like of that age, what do they like or dislike? And I decided they don't like being treated like children. So gave me the title, Don't Treat Me Like a Child. And that was my first song. And um, I wrote Don't Treat Me Like a Child, and it actually got to number three in the charts which was subsequently followed by another song called You Don't Know, which went to number one, and the third one, Walking Back to Happiness, which sold well over a million records and won Mike Hawk and I the um, Ivan Novello Award, which is the biggest song you could win as a songwriter. It was, the, it was the biggest song of the year in 1961. I've written a lot more songs for her since then, of course, but um, I somehow got tagged with that song, and uh, everything I do is all oh, Walking Back to Happiness, and it's a song everybody knows. Um, yes, it is. Um, 40, Double-edged sword. Yes, uh, you know, in 40 years, and it's into um, what called public domain, and um, I was getting a little bit worried that it was, um, sorry, 40, 50 years old, 1961 it was written. Um, but I'm glad to say that's been resolved, I think. And because if it goes into public domain, obviously you don't earn royalties No, anymore. you don't. You know, yes, and that song is, is used a lot in this country, especially. It is a lot. On ra yes, radio and yeah. classic stuff. Yeah. But so you've got an extension at 75 years. You've got years. an extension. Uh, and, um, now, someone sorry? in the chat room has mentioned that uh, John invented Justin Bieber, but it was a girl. <laughs> really? I didn't know that. <laughs> I'll tell you what mate if you invented Justin Bieber there's two things you need to consider one you're probably going to be a rich man secondly I'm probably going to kill you after the show <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which is worse really <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean it because I'm sure you didn't invent Justin Bieber you wouldn't do something so evil no but Justin Bieber is only a product of today as Helen Shapiro is a product of yesterday if you like but I mean it's I the same thing I think what they're alluding to, John, is you were the first to to do something like that, where Justin Bieber is just a uh, is just a poor copy of what you did with Helen Shapiro. Yeah, I, well, that's nice to, that you said that. Yeah, so that is one way of looking at it. I mean, I do like to think that I think the '60s, um, where I was brought up in, was much more innovative, music-wise. I think music has lost itself down the road with all this. 
modern day technology and everything like that, I think where is music, you know, the real value of music, the real artist, the real song. And I think that you can't replace the 60s. The 60s will live forever. Where will today's, dare I ask, where will today's music, will that be around in 20, 30, 40 years' time? Will we, talk, will we be talking about songs that are written today in that time? Where I mean, the, the, music, the music will be definitely different and probably more electronic, but you can't replace a good song. No, exactly right. Absolutely right, you can't. And, uh, you know, the music of the 60s is the most exciting period. I was, I'm very lucky to have been brought up in the music industry of the 60s and through to the 70s. And, of course, I, I uh, formed my own record label in the 70s. And um, I don't know, you know, I've been 40 years in the music industry now and, and uh, still in it, just, <laughs> uh, and experiencing what it's like to record a, an album, uh, you know, today. And it's very different. Ab to what I was doing uh, 40 years ago. So let's talk a bit about you, John. Me? You. Ivan Novella Award winning songwriter yeah. for Walking Back to Happiness with Helen Shapiro. Yeah. You've worked with Cliff Richard. Yeah. Uh, Status Quo. Yeah. Uh, you're an artist yourself, releasing, yeah. was it 19 albums? Yeah, written. Yeah. Of instrumental orchestral stuff, yeah. mainly. Yeah. Uh, at a number one. Um, no, my number ones have been songwriting wise with Helen Shapiro. I've had yep. two number ones. I won the Avon Novella Award for the big best song of the year in 1961. The song was Walking Back to Happiness. And what was the other one? Well, you don't know who the other one was. Cast Your Fate to the Wind? No, Cast Your Fate to the no. Wind was my orchestra. Right. Uh, called Sounds Orchestral. Needless to say, it made the top 50 in the States, I think. And we made 17 albums following that all over the world, but uh, sadly, uh, the pianist in Sounds of Orchestra was Johnny Pearson, and he died a few months ago. I remember you saying, really yeah. really sad, yeah. So I was quite upset about that. Understandable. Mm. So what was the other number one? The other num no, the two number ones, from my own writing point of view, were Walking Back to Happiness and You Don't Know. Those were the two songs that went to number one. Oh, I thought one. you said You Don't Know. You said I didn't know. No, You Don't Know is the name of the song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was Helen Shapiro again? Yeah, that was Helen Shapiro, yeah. So and who, did, who did that? Helen Shapiro. Uh, Helen Shapiro. The who? She, the who? She, was, <laughs> she was 13 and a half years old. Oh, my goodness. When she got that song. I found her. I discovered her in 1962, 61, 62. And I wrote all her songs, and two of them went to number one. And uh, You Don't Know was the first number one. And she was at that time... Uh, just 13 and a half years old. Sort of, it was the time of Brenda Lee, that sort of era. Yeah. You know? Way before I was born, John. Absolutely, yeah. yeah well, <laughs> I've actually produced, when I wrote my book, uh, you know, called Sex and Violins, uh, I had to relive the whole of my career virtually, and uh, luckily I had a very good memory. And I've actually produced no less than 170 artists. Wow. Spanning the uh, 40 years I've been in the uh, British music industry. And no uh, lawsuits. Sorry? And no lawsuits. That's amazing. Actually, one. <laughs> <laughs> one in 107. I was, I, was, I was going for, you know, a perfect record for you, John. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and and for, for our American viewers, you were the man that brought Motown to the UK, weren't you? For, yeah. America, including yeah. Little Stevie Wonder. Yeah, well, I, I wined and dined Berry Gordy at the Talk of the Town in Leicester Square in London in, um, oh, must be about 19, some, 1970, somewhere, 71, somewhere, or maybe before that. No, uh, but anyway, from that uh, winding and dining him that evening uh, with Barney Ailes and Esther Edwards, uh, his secretary, uh, I managed to consummate the distribution rights for the Town and Motown label for the record company that I was working for at the time, which was called Oriel Records, which was the smallest independent British record company. And we managed to get the distribution rights from the Town and Motown record uh, label. So I started to release the product, and I remember the first release was um, The Contours, Mary Wells, and The Marvelettes. I decided to go out with them, hit them hard, and we released three very big chart records, American chart records at the same time. Mm. Sadly, you know, it took two years of sheer frustration and dedication 
on the part of myself and all the staff at Oriel Records to try and break Tamla Motown in, in, in England and no one wanted to know. We couldn't even get it played on the radio. No one wanted to know about it at all. And it was only at the end of the two years that we managed to break Stevie Wonder's Fingertips Part 2, which was our one and only hit on Oriel Records. At the end of the two years, the contract came up for review and EMI came along and said, thank you very much. And their first release was My Guy Mary Wells. And you know what happened to that. Oh, wow. So we've done two years of absolute oh, dedication to the product and to how great it was. I mean, I lived, ate, ate and breathed it every day of my life during those two years I was with that company. But we couldn't get anybody. No one wanted to play the stuff. They just didn't want to know about it. It was, it was so frustrating and disheartening. Because as well as being uh, a songwriter, a producer... An artist yourself, you've actually owned record labels as well, Alaska? Yes, is Alaska is my own record label, which I formed in 1972. But um, it's funny enough because um, the atmosphere of the talk of the town, when I took Barry Gordy out to dinner, I thought, what am I going to talk to him about? And of course, I thought, he's a songwriter. We've got something in common. So we started talking about songs, and that led to other things and so on. And uh, uh, dare I say, I won him over, if you like. <laughs> and... Uh, managed to get the uh, the distribution rights for this label and oh my god there were some fantastic records as you all know as we all know but needless to say dare I say I get little or no credit uh, and Oriel not for this for what we did during those two years everybody thinks that Tamla Motown, Motown started its its journey with EMI in England it did not for two years it was with me and Oriel Records and we suffered hell and back to get that stuff aired and played and distributed mm. But, you know, so I, I feel proud, actually, that I contributed to its success, if you like. But you worked with EMI as well, didn't you? Yes. I was with EMI for four and a half years, yeah. Yep. And you were one of the leaders in bringing video to the UK as well, weren't you? Music videos. Mm, yeah, I suppose so. You were involved very early I on in the trade. I was involved early on in it, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was, I was very much, you know... Uh, a major cog in the in the wheel. I made myself a, a major cog in the music industry in those days, you mm. know. And um, you know, you survived by hit records. You had to make hit records. If you were signed to a record company as the label manager, your job was to make hit records. And if you didn't make hit records, you were out in a year, gone. Mm. And um, with every record label I joined, and I've been with three major record companies, uh, you know, they got the major task of finding new artists and assessing their potentiality as we do here listen to to product you know songs and everything this is what you're listening to yeah you're finding the right artist for the right song and then you've got to put it together and arrange it and i mean records are made so differently today to what they were made in in my day you as know. you're finding out at the moment right? absolutely yeah because you're working with sam kelly and the samandi crew sam kelly's obviously a guest on the show for us as well i am actually making uh, in the middle of her recording uh, samandi's fourth album the three albums I made in 72, 73, 74, about that. And we had a lot of, we had a big top 30 record in the States called The Message. And Samandi went to America and they toured with Al Green. And then they went again to and did a tour on their own in their own name. We played the um, uh, Apollo Theatre in Harlem and all this stuff and, you mm. know, Philadelphia. It was fantastic. They've got quite a big fan following. And yet this band have not been together for 40 years and they approached me to put together a fourth album because there's a demand for it. And I said, I couldn't believe that we managed to do it. We're midway through it now. and it's, it's, it's fantastic because I wanted to produce it as if you were producing the band in the old days, but with the benefit of digital recording of these days. So it's a mixture of the two things together that will give Samandi 2012 or 2013, maybe when it's released, something that is vitally different. Mm. And I hear you've been working Mr. Sam Kelly hard because you've swapped studios and you've oh, found out that the, the drum sound is totally different between the two we studios. We've had a lot of problems. Let me tell you, we had a lot of problems with the first studio we went to. And uh, the biggest problem was that what we were hearing back in the control room, which we thought was fantastic, when we actually got it back home on our little machine, it was nothing like the sound that we heard. Mm. So the code, con what you heard in the control room did not represent the sound that you actually recorded sound, which was disaster. And when we went into it, 
and we went to another studio, which is the studio in now, and discovered what actually went on in those initial tracks that mm. we recorded. There was overspill coming from percussion onto the drums and all the rest of it. It was absolute dirge, rhythmically. And yet, what you heard through the monitors in the control room sounded absolutely Clean and spot crisp. on. Yeah. It was so misleading. We had to do the drum tracks again on three of the songs. Sam redid that, uh, played exactly what he played at the original studio in the new studio. Yeah. And we managed to cure the problem. There you go. And I, he said you've been working him hard, John. You've been cracking yeah, that he's, whip, you Yeah, he doesn't like being worked hard. But he <laughs> <laughs> Let's go over to London, England, and talk to Mr. Ian Husbands. Ian, I know you have someone special there. Our guest panelist joining you this week. So uh, I want to say hello to both you and Mr. John Schroeder. Hi, guys. Hi there. Hello. Sorry, I had to do the shave thing. I can't let Tom be the only one. Uh -huh. <laughs> now. Well, now, uh, so over in uh, London, I know that things are quite exciting there at the uh, husband's domain. It's always exciting when Mr. Schroeder comes around. That, hmm. It's exactly nice what I mean. It's exactly what I mean. So we're happy that you could rope John Schroeder into coming over to your place, first of all. But it didn't take a lot of convincing, to be honest. Not really, no. The, pay, the paycheck's a bit heavy on my wages, but, you know, we'll, we'll yeah, sort that one out. Yeah. I, I decided he's worth the effort. And, uh, you know, he's a good <laughs> lad. He's worth the effort? Worth the effort. <laughs> worth the effort. I think you're right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Feeling the love. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, feeling the love. Well, Before uh, we uh, have really a quick chat let with you John. Know I am back. <laughs> Cheers, Tom. Glad to have you back. Box of crap, what are you doing? Any chance? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> before, we, before we get chatting with, uh, with John, I'll just, we'll do the witness uh, statement announcement. Certainly, we? certainly. Please do. Let me uh, recap last week for everyone. Our uh, broadcast last week had uh, three songs, as usual, in front of our panel. Uh, Kim Kondrashoff with Cry Wolf was the song of the week selectee. S. Dot Madison with Might Not Remember and uh, Incomplete Neighbor with Hall of Mirrors round out the three songs that the panelists had to select from. Ian, what did our audience have to say? Well, I was outvoted last week. I felt Hall of Mirrors should have been the song of the week, but right. the guys voted for Cry Wolf by uh, Kim Kondrashoff. Um, and that was the song of the week, except no one agreed with any of us. Really? Yeah, that's because I wasn't there. Yeah, I was on the other one. Everyone went for song two, uh, which was Might Not Remember by S. Dot Madison. Uh, best songwriting, 84% of the votes. Best performance, 76% of the votes. And best mixed production, 84% of the votes. So uh, the viewers highly disagreed last week. It sounds like it. It sounds like uh, they had their minds definitely made up by what they heard, and, uh, and you guys didn't know anything. Obviously, you know, maybe we'll just hand the show over to the audience next time. They can, they can do the work. Now, they have had, uh, had, had the opportunity or the burden to vote a song of the week before. Indeed. Indeed. A couple of times now. It's very rare. But it does happen. It certainly does. Now, uh, let's talk with John for a little bit because uh, John came all the way over to your place, and, and we're so happy you did, John, first of all. And welcome back to the broadcast. Well, I'm really glad to see you guys again. It really keeps me in the running of the business, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I've just come out of the studio and finished an album with a band called Samandi after two years. Now, so I, I, I know that you have been working very hard, very diligently <laughs> with the guys from Samandi. Uh, yeah. You have uh, also, you know, your career is a long, lustrous, legendary career. And, uh, you know, I mean, gosh, what can you say about the things you've done over the years? Um, you know, putting together Helen Shapiro, you know, discovering Helen Shapiro, uh, being involved in that, uh, walking back to happiness, uh, putting that song together. Ivo Nobe or Ivor Nobella award winner. I mean, you've just had an amazing career. And I think, uh, you know, from my perspective, I think the thing that amazes me most is being involved with introducing Motown over to the United Kingdom, which is just truly an amazing feat in itself. 
Yeah, I, that, 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 that happened in 1971, 72, and uh, I entertained Barry Gordy. I took him out to dinner one night at uh, the Talk of the Town in London and uh, consummated a distribution deal for the Tamil Motown label. It had no distribution in England at that time. And I was, uh, I took over the uh, range of being a label manager with a small record company called Oriole and created the Oriole American label, especially for the distribution of the Tamil Motown product. And for two years, whilst I was the label manager with Oriole, started putting out the uh, Tamil Motown product, which, dare I say, nobody wanted to know. We couldn't get airplay on it or anything. Nobody, the BBC didn't, couldn't, wanted to play it, but couldn't play it because it stood out in their programs too much against other type of material and uh, we had a major major headache for two years of sweat blood sweat and tears and we came through with the first hit um which was uh, stevie stevie wonder's uh fingertips part two mm -hmm. i remember just, that very well that was our first hit and do you know after that broke the charts in england we lost the deal with motown and it went to emi oh. and so uh, you know i feel Proud in a way to have been associated and got Motown over to England, but few people know, and it really sort of does upset me somewhat of the amount of work and belief that was done by the staff and myself in putting that Motown product out for those first two years, and for EMI to start putting it out and you know come straight in with Mary Wells and all this my guy and all this stuff after what we'd done for the two years prior to it. It, it really sort of is quite upsetting, really. Yeah, I, I can well imagine that it would be. Uh, but, you know, the, the feat in and of itself of being able to bring Motown to the UK is is just a phenomenal thing. And and I think you deserve, you know, huge congratulations from everybody in the UK and even from here in the United States, because without you, it probably wouldn't have happened anytime soon. Well, I don't know. I mean, the product was so strong. I think it would have happened... It would have happened, but uh, I, I was just, you know, I, I foresaw it happening before it happened, and uh, I heard it before it actually happened and uh, stuck with it. And, uh, you know, and the funny thing was, because this, this product was heard in Liverpool, which is a port in the north of England, and all this early Motown stuff used to come into the port, and the bands in Liverpool, of which I took a mobile recording unit up to Liverpool and made two albums, and all these bands in Liverpool were playing Motown stuff that no one had ever heard before because they got it off the ships. You know, the ships came into the port and they heard this, this music before we ever, ever, ever heard anything of it. It was really, really strange, you know. But um, I don't know. I feel, I feel very proud to have been involved with it and brought it over. But I also feel hurt that nobody recognized the work and the belief that me and my cohorts did with that label for those two years. Now, you weren't just the man to sort of bring Motown to England. You also took the first British black band to break in America, didn't you, to chart in America? Yeah, well, you're going, we're talking about Samandi again. Yeah, we're going back to Samandi, but I think that's a relevant thing to talk about. I mean, you, you brought American music to, to England. You yeah. took exported English music out to America. Well, that's, that's right. And actually, it happened at the same time because I found this black, uh, this black band, Samandi, in 1971, 72, which is around about the same time as, the, um, uh, as my time at Oriel, uh, I think. Or I think it was. I mean, yeah. But, um, you know, and uh, Samandi was completely unknown. And I just because I happened to know... Um, Marvin Schlachter at Chess Records, and uh, I, and he asked me what I was doing. I said I got involved with a black band. And I said took me into the studio, and cut two or three tracks with them. He said, "Why don't you let me hear it?" And I sent it over to him. And in two weeks' time, I got a really excited cable, and uh, he wanted to put the product out. And that was the beginning of of this tremendous thing with this band. And uh, you know, ended up with a, a top twenty single, The Message, and an album. Uh, they went to America and with a support group with Al Green and uh, oh, amazing! But you also it wasn't just Samadhi you were working with them. You had Alaska Records, didn't you? Yes. Which was a huge roster of artists. Yes. And that's just now been digitally distributed, isn't it? Yes. Uh, my own label, Alaska Records, hasn't been released digitally. 
uh, since it was formed in 1972, and um, it is for the first time with a company called Resolution, and uh, they are releasing Samandi, funny enough, the first three albums digitally for the first time. Samandi's never been released digitally before, which is quite amazing. Well, not legally. Not legally, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I mean, that catch? and it's that's available now on iTunes and Amazon. Well, presumably it is. I mean, I, you know, I, I have to say I'm not conversant with the modern method of selling music today, the digital and iTunes and God knows what all this stuff is. So obviously, you know, is fairly foreign to me. Mm. And you know, it's a different, it's a whole different ball game to what I'm used to of uh, making records and uh, you know finding. Uh, tracks that are strong enough to that might be singles and making a chart record and an album that follows a released in vinyl and all the rest of it but it's a whole different ball game today and uh, it's funny enough that Alaska Records and uh, I've got a lot of product on Alaska Records has never seen the light of day digitally until now mm. and this company is beginning to release it and they've started to release Samandi who's being the first artist and it, I, I, pretty good really i'm really really pleased but i mean on the front of legal stuff i mean you found out that a lot of samandi stuff and other artists has been sampled without you knowing about it you're actually doing something about that aren't you set up a licensing company with a couple of friends yes um i've got uh, dare i say a lawyer and a licensing lady involved we're tracing all the stuff that's been illegally uh, put out there and um you know I don't like to say pirated. I hate that word pirated and so on, but um, this is what happens. And um, a lot of my stuff has found its way into all sorts of places all over the world, uh, particularly, you know, Samandi. And we're beginning to track down a lot of it right now. And it's uh, very interesting. I mean, um, the Fuji's sampled Samandi years ago uh, and sold 13 million records using one of my tracks. And you sued them, right? And we sued them, I have to say, yeah. But, you know, Funny I don't, now that Lauren Hill's in prison for non-payment of taxes as well. Well, maybe a coincidence. But there. you know, I don't like the. Yeah, I hate the industry in this aspect of it. Mm. I, I like the industry to be positive and you know about the music it makes, not all this stuff about lawyer cases and stealing things and pirating things. Yeah, I mean, just but, sitting on Wikipedia tonight, weren't we, with my yeah. wife beforehand, finding yeah. out that Aswad covered the message, and it's been used in uh, what was it, Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas. Yes. And Ocean's Eleven and all this stuff that John's now got to go away and follow up. Yeah, this is generally right. Well, I mean, you know, for me, I'm. It's taken me two years to put together a new Samandi album, which is um, I'm very, you know, involved with, and uh, you know, it's kept me alive really. But for two years, we put this album together, and this is Samandi's fourth album. They've got a very strong fan following in England. And I believe that they've still got a following in America. So I'm uh, I'm looking towards some good things with this new album. It is totally, not totally different to what they did before, but I think it's much more commercial. Mm. But knowing what happened to them before, you know, I want to try and protect the same thing happen again, <laughs> you know, that we can get some success with what we've actually done this time that is legally art, you know. Yeah, well, I'm not saying I've heard the album, but I have heard. It's very good, John. Oh, well, thank you for that, Ian. You know, what your thoughts are very... Is, is, that, is that correct? Yes, it's, yeah. it's very good? That's correct, I mean, as yeah. the producer, is it very good? Yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you oh. what, we can't wait to hear it, and I certainly hope that, that once it's released... Uh, in fact, I, I will make this... I, I will say this. Once it's released, I'll oh. get a copy of it so I can hear it. That's for sure. I want you both to hear it. I want your comments. I want to hear track by track comments from you guys. <laughs> so a whole Samandi MSI ripped the album apart session. How yeah, about that? there, there you go. Why not? You, you up we'll for get, that? We'll time? Simon as guest. I know it's special. Ian, how are you today, sir? And, and I see that you have Mr. John Schroeder with you today. I am here with Mr. John Schroeder, and behind the screen, Die as well. So um, there's three of us sitting here to do the show today. Say hello, Die. Hello. There you go, you see. <laughs> well, I'm really pleased to be back here again, and uh, Diane happens to be my fiance, and uh, we got engaged about a year ago. Mm. It's the last time I saw Ian, and uh, so I'm really, really pleased to be back here again. Well, uh, Wait, you got engaged to Ian? Yeah, and I was engaged to Ian. Yeah. Well, look, there's a ring. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, congratulations <laughs> to you, John. And you uh, as as I was telling her earlier, she has been lucky enough to get hooked to and grab on to a very talented man. So. Oh, well, I'm truly honored by that statement. <laughs> I just do my job like you, everybody does, uh, and I uh, just want to make good music and make people happy. Yeah. Well, we're happy to have you back with us now. Uh, you said it's been almost a year, about a year since you've seen Ian. So that means uh -huh. it's been at least that long since you've been on the broadcast with us. So Absolutely way true. Too long. Yeah. Yeah, it is way yeah. too long. I agree with Tommy. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been up to in the preceding year? How have things been going for you? I'm sure you've been busy in studio and things like that. Well, I have been busy in the studio primarily with one particular artist, namely Samandi. Um, uh, this band, I found them in 1971, 72, and uh, we recorded uh, three albums. Uh, we had, uh, at that time, a top 20 hit in America, a uh, top 50 album, and the band have been to America. We played the Apollo uh, Theatre in Harlem and all that stuff. Uh, they were with Al Green. and Anyway, that's going back years, some years ago, but now we're really happy to have um, produced their fourth album. It's taken two years to make, so that's what, I, what I've been involved with. And... Uh, I can enlighten you some more as we go on about the new album. Well, I definitely am interested to hear more about it. I, I especially want to hear how much of a uh, uh, pain in the backside Sam has w was to work with during the creation of that album. <laughs> well, that's a bit unfair. Where did that come from? <laughs> he's, well, just, he's just digging for dirt, basically. I am. I'm that's digging for... Doing. Exactly. So the next time Sam Kelly comes on with us, I have something to... Uh, to 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 say about him you know he's a very <laughs> mysterious guy i cannot think of two more gentler gentlemen than sam and john they must get along great and the creative yeah. juices must spark sam sam is a is a is a great drummer has become a great drummer starting with the band in 1970 and playing some andy music but the guy has really worked really hard and become a very much in demand session musician and he's playing on all sorts of gigs and going around all the world playing and he's very hard to get hold of and to get yes. him onto the new Samandi album and get involved with the new product was actually pretty difficult to do so so in other words john i guess uh, we'll have to wait to get the dirt on sam until after we're off the air well, you will really, yes. <laughs> yes, I think you will, yes. Somehow I feel like just uh, getting hold of him was the biggest pain. Yeah, he is hard to get a hold of. That is very true. And uh, we're just glad to have you here with us, John. And uh, congratulations again on uh, the upcoming nuptials. Well, thank you very much. Well, there's been no decision on that, but uh, we made the first step. <laughs> hey, that's half the battle right there. Yeah. So let's let's talk a bit about the album, John. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's, yeah, let's sure. tell everyone a bit about what we've got. Crazy game, guys. Well, there you go. This is a promo version. Yeah. Not quite the finished product. It's a great it's, album cover choice as well. Yeah, that's the sampler package. It contains four tracks. The overall title of the album is Crazy Game. And if you listen to the lyric of that song and understand what the world we're living is, it's just a crazy game. Um, uh, the great thing about Samandi, they're very, very capable of writing very infectious material, uh, very rhythmic material. They've had a sustained fan club for many, many, many years, and it's still in existence. And there is a demand for a fourth album. I mean, that's not bad, you know, four albums. Um, but this album, Samandi 2014, had to be a bit different from the others. It had to be a development from the previous three albums. I would add here uh, that the previous three albums, namely uh, Samandi, Second Time Round and Promise Heights, have just been released digitally for the first time. And uh, so they should be reaching uh, the world ears, if you like, almost right now. But they're paving the way for this new album, which hopefully will see the light of day internationally within the next 
two or three months. And the, these are available on iTunes, Amazon, yeah, all and all stuff. of the big, yeah. re, big yeah. digital retailers. Yeah. And um, the band are being put together again. They're getting the band together again. We've been asked to do the Jules Holland show, which is a t- major TV show here. And down the road, Glastonbury, the Glastonbury Festival, which would be a tremendous exposure for them. That'd be fantastic. But for me, this album was really, really exciting. It was a challenge because having not been in the studio and recorded anything for 30 years, and to select the material, unfortunately, there are very prolific writers. I selected all the material, arranged it, put it all together. And, um, well... I think it's I think it's a strong album. I, I think I think Samandi are always a, an incredibly original band, very identifiable, mm, very definitely. melodic, um, and very much today. And a lot of people might not know the name, but there's a right. good chance they've heard the music in films. Well, in I think films that this album more than any of the other albums, Ian, will open a new market for them because totally. the material it's got a much wider audience. It's uh, more commercial, if you like. Yeah. I mean, having having heard what I've heard and knowing some of the back catalogue as well. Yeah. It, they, It'd be interesting to know what Tommy thinks of it, you know, from a, from a, a technical point of view. But uh, we went out to record this with an analogue approach initially because Samandi Ara have got a live feel about them and we want to retain that infectious live feel of rhythmically about it. And so we, the original engineer has been involved with it and uh, we set up the studio in an analog fashion and really didn't get involved with Pro Tools until we came to the mixing. Uh, so we've got, hopefully, the best of both worlds uh, today and yesterday, mm. if you like. It does sound that way. You, it's definitely got an analog feel, but it's got a much more contemporary mix to it. Well, thank you very much. Well, that's so, from my opinion, anyway. From what no, I don't know. So. I'm too close to it yeah. to know. But to me, I'm very inwardly very happy with it. <coughs> I'll tell you what, Darren, we've did got... you do any in video in studio videos to add to the live feel to it? No, it would have been. It just wasn't possible to do that. Uh, it was thought of, but but um, if you know what it was to record it, <coughs> excuse me. And the studios we recorded it in, uh, it was very difficult to do that. So uh, we've now got to put all the marketing and the promotion together and. Uh, after the event, if you like. Yeah. Let's have a let's have a listen to Crazy Game. We've got a clip. Um, We're going to play about thirty seconds on. I think. Is well, that I haven't right, heard it for ages, but I, um, you haven't heard it for ages. No. <laughs> so you're looking forward to this listen as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. But am. this, guys, is an exclusive. This has not been played anywhere else. So sure. we are emphasising the first to carry a sample of Crazy Game by Samandi. So uh, give it a proper introduction, John. Well, let me introduce uh, Samandi's from Fancy's Samandi's forthcoming album. Title track and name of the album, Crazy Game. Well, that was uh, that was an achievement. That's what we were trying to achieve. So, uh, when you get so close to these things, as you know, you really don't know. And by the end of it, you you get confused yourself and say. What have I done? You know, <laughs> you become deaf to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think my first marriage. One of the things that stood out to me on that, uh, and and by no means I'm I'm not a panelist on the show in any way, shape, or form. It had a very wide feel to it. I mean, it felt like I've heard uh, the previous Samandi track that we've had on uh, MSI, and this one. The difference between the two is this sounded more spread out, as Tommy likes to say a lot. Uh, yeah. There was more room in the mix than uh, the previous uh, track I've heard from Samandi. That's absolutely right. Yeah, that was that was the initial idea. Uh, I think the when combination you... of um, analog and digital d- it did work. John, um, there's a phrase called "in the box" when you use like a door, like Pro Tools or whatever. Um, was it all done in the computer, or was it run through like an analog board or any out? Or gear processing, or all, all done computer wise. Yes, it, it was. It was done that way, and uh, I mean, we set the studio up in an analog fashion and recorded it. Um, I don't think it wasn't recorded onto tape, um, but we got the analog feel from live feel from the studio, and uh, did the whole tracks like that, and, and then finally got to. The digital stage, not until the mixing. 
Okay. Thank and, you very much. And we're getting some of the guys and gals out in the chat room giving some feedback to you. Uh, said it's very nice. Uh, one of the guys, the musician out there, goes, yeah. And uh, they said they heard about 40 seconds or so of it. So they appear to like it very well, John. It's, so I know why we only heard five seconds, because you forgot to press the wrong button. It's great. I, I mean, Samandi uh, wanted to if I could interject. I'm not unknown over there, because... Uh, uh, you know, all the three albums have been released over there in, during the 70s. They've got uh, a fan base, they've got a website, and, uh, you know, they're fairly well known in America. In fact, they're really more well known over there than they are over here. Yeah, in fact, I was talking with uh, one of our previous guest panelists at one point, uh, Susie Chase in New York City. She has a, uh, a broadcast she does, which is the number one podcast of soul music uh, in the U.S., and yeah. she's heard of Samandi and uh, yeah. has enjoyed their music very well. Well, the big track at the time was The Message, which made the top 20. Uh, and the album called Samandi followed it, uh, made made the top top billboard 100, I think, at the time. Well, we appreciate your definitely, uh, we appreciate your uh, sharing uh, the title track, Crazy Game, with us, even though we played just a bit of it for everyone. Uh, we appreciate you doing that. Pleasure, absolutely pleasure. Yeah. Exclusive, guys and girls, from yeah. Mr. John Schroeder himself. There you have it. There you have it. Now, with the gift. Exactly. Well, we've got a long way to go. We've got a lot of work to do on it, but it's all beginning now, and it's all happening right this minute. And I'm very pleased that you guys should be the first to be in on it, and I can only hope and pray that it uh, does what we all hope it's going to do. Well, based, based on what I heard, I think uh, I think you've done a great job. Mr. John Schroeder is there. So, John, Ian, welcome once again. Glad to see you, John. You're looking good. Glad to be here, Rich. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's, it's always great to have you on the broadcast. Uh, and I know Ian is tickled to death. He, he's been talking about you coming over for at least a week or so. And right. uh, he, he really <clears throat> enjoys it when you drop by. Well, I'm very pleased to do that. I'm also pleased to see uh, Andrea there. I uh, brings Vegas back into my life because I've been there two or three times. Um, last time, not so long ago, and uh, as she says, it's a nightmare, to, especially for tourists. Uh, not used to. We can just cross a road in London, you know, and look left and right. You can't do that in Vegas, you know. <laughs> we we came unstuck quite a few times when we went over there, but it's a fantastic place. I don't think I could. Uh, I don't think I could live there personally. But uh, there you are. Go on. I'm how glad I, Andrea really, really into well, it. Well, we were, how much, how we much were talking about that before before the show. Rich was asking, you know, how yeah. you can live here. But it's a it's an extreme place. But it's the trade off is the music. It really it's is. The mu it's, oh, yeah, it's the music. Yeah. There's nowhere. There's nowhere else in the world like it. The only place no. that I. The only place I think that I've been in the world that has had the same nostalgia, but n not the same nostalgia, but nostalgia, was uh, New Orleans. Right. Uh, you know, but that's got the same music connotation, same place that those guys played all those years ago. Uh, fantastic. And after it was sort of brought to, uh, desecrated really through, through that, yeah. that tragedy, it was such a shame to music, to me, you know. Anyway. Yes. I'm here now, so I'm real pleased to be here. Happy times. <laughs> yeah. and, and like I said, we're glad to have you back with us. Now, uh, I want to know what's been happening with you since we last had you on the show. It has been a long while, far too long in between times you've appeared on the show. Uh, so, so how have you been? How have things been going and what's been going on? Well, i am uh, kept myself busy. I have my own uh, uh, company uh, that owns all the past recordings of my own record label which was formed in 1972 its name being alaska and um, some of the alaska product is now being re-released digitally for the first time uh the big band on my record label and it was a struggle in those days with a you know a small record label mm. uh was a band called samandi yeah uh whom you might well know of because Absolutely. um completely unknown we managed to the first actually it's the first british black band to have made the top 20 in the cash box top 100 uh with a song called the message and um subsequently an album and the band toured the states 
uh, with Al Green and then on their own. And this was this was about 19, uh, 1972, 73, somewhere around there. I wasn't even born, John. You know, but we've made three albums and those three albums have substantiated a considerable fan following, which is still in existence today. And um, a certain record label uh, is just re-released all three albums digitally for the first time. So that I've been involved with that. Meanwhile, we've got the band together, found them in all different places. They're all doing different things now. Two of them are lawyers, believe it or not. And uh, after 40 years of not playing anything, we did uh, our first gig. Cool. Um, they've done four gigs now and reformed. Um, and we're looking towards next year as to um, hoping that the fourth album, which I produced about a year and a half, two years ago, it must be now, is yeah. going to actually come out on general release after Christmas next year. And I haven't heard any samples, and I, I couldn't tell you it was good, but it, it is good. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I seem to have talked too much, but anyway, no, no. That's, basic, that's basically what I've been involved with, and to uh, you know put a band together after 40 years, um, two of the members, members having passed away as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. and the finding the finance to do it, the finance is always a huge headache with making album, album product, you know. Mm -hmm. And we did it, you know, and now, now we've got it. And to actually see them play live gave me a tremendous kick of having found that band in 1972 that they are still playing this stuff and they've got a huge fan following still today. Yeah, no, it, I think it's a real shame that, that there was no one there with a video camera constantly to document no. that whole, course, whole process. You know, Rich, and we, we made it in America first. England didn't want to know. Mm. They didn't want to know. It was, it was America and Europe mm. that uh, wow. really got to grips with that band. And now England has now suddenly realized, oh, these guys are good, you know. Yeah. Now, how has it changed in, in regards to, uh, to producing and marketing bands, you know, like Samandi in today's music world? I mean, uh, music has, has changed quite a bit, to be perfectly honest, between the early 70s and now. Uh, has that changed the way you market a, a band like Samandi getting back together? Um, yes, in in a number of ways it has, but Samandi is Samandi, and Samandi's big uh, big plus is that they are totally original in their concept. They write mm. their own material. They've got tremendous percussive feels. They've got it's a very catchy outfit, you know, and they've got a big fan following. And the fan following are telling uh, families are telling their children, and the word is spread, you know. But to promote. The new Samandi album, which we've uh, we've just made, well, actually about a year and a half now, is extremely difficult in today's marketplace. Right. It's not like the seventies mm -hmm. days. You can't you can't go to record companies get advances of substantial advances to cover your costs anymore. It's just a whole different ball game. And I think promoting the new Samandi is going to come from live gigs, and we're concentrating on getting the band together doing live gigs, and after 40 years, they've done only four. So we're looking to next year to doing, you know. But the amazing thing is these gigs that I went to, uh, they were packed. They couldn't right. move, packed. So, you know, word of mouth gets around about it. Now, They're spreading the word, you know. Have, have these live gigs been all uh, exclusive to the UK, or are you planning on uh, some maybe next year in the rest of Europe, maybe the US? No, they've done two gigs in the UK, in London, and they've done two in France. They have a big European following. Oh, excellent. And uh, they sold out in two gigs in France. I can't remember where they were now, but uh, they were quite substantial places uh, uh, with about, you know, 1,500, 2,000 people, perhaps. Yeah. You know, which is quite something for a band that haven't played together mm -hmm. for 40 years, 30, 35 yeah, years. that's great. Yeah. So that's been my vacation since I last saw you, Rich, and uh, it's been a hell of a, a road, actually, putting it all together and getting them together and, uh, you know, and all the rest of it. But, uh, you know, it's it's all there still. It's The magic is still there after all that time. I spoke with Sam, and um, yeah. he said that he was really enjoying the gigs they've done. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. going really, really well. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad Sam Kelly, the drummer, yeah. that is, yeah. from Samandi. Good, good. 
over to the legendary, and I use that term quite correctly, by the way, Mr. Maybe John Schroeder. Me. Oh, no, no. that's that's nice. Legendary. I, I like that. Yes, good. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen something successful then. Well, no, no. He's happy, he's happy. He's happy. now he's going to go home. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the word that Ian had on the card when you walked in the door. It's the secret word. If the secret word is said, you're free to go. Was that what it is? That's right. <laughs> All right. Okay. We're, we're, we're playing Rich Wildman bingo. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's great to have you on again, John. I know it's been a while. Uh, what is it, five months, six months, something along those lines? Yeah, it's yes, five or six months. It was before Christmas, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, since then, um, I got married in March to the lovely Diane. Who's okay. over the back there, but you can't see her. Say hello, Diane. And um, we're looking forward to some belated honeymoon. We're going to go on a vi what they call a Viking cruise. On the Danube, and we're going to see Budapest, um, Nuremberg, and Prague. So we're looking forward, very much forward to that. When you say you're going to see them on a Viking longboat, do you mean you're invading? Yes. Yeah. Just, just check. Of course. He's got his horny helmet and everything. You know yeah. I mean? You got to, you got to take the right, correct direction. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they don't let you on otherwise. Photos, or it didn't happen. I'm not a photo of his horny helmet. Yeah. Steady now, James. Come on. It's yeah. family. No, it's not really. It's not anyway, that's, uh, that's a major, major, what we're looking forward to a great deal. To the uh, meantime, I've been very heavily with writing, and uh, I've, uh, I've got, I'm writing my third book in the middle of it at the moment, and um, the second book, which is a, a cat book and, and describes the therapeutic powers of the cat, um, I'm re-putting that book together with with new photographs and new cover and so on, and that's being reissued in September. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And um, I've noticed that um, the number one best-selling book in the, in the U.S. was quite recently a book called Dewey, The Library Cat. And I've read that, and I've looked at that book and looked at my book and found uh, where I was going wrong. So I'm revamping the cover of it and tightening the book up, and the publishers are going to reissue it in September, so that's that's a big time for me. Uh, that's, um, that, that, John, right? Yep. We, we've got a lot to talk about from your point of view. Yeah, yep. you'll get you're up to load at the moment, load of stuff at the moment. But it's very rare we get a chance to have someone like you on the show that knows so much about James. <laughs> but more interestingly enough, you managed to catch up with uh, Status Quo. Not too long ago, didn't you? I did indeed, yes. These, Who you've got a bit of a history with, obviously. Yeah, I found them and produced them for five years. And we had, well, they've, they've been in the business for over 25 years now, mm. that band. Fantastic. And I produced them for five years. And I caught out with them at the Royal Albert Hall in London, um, oh, not very long ago, and went to their concert and uh, their gig, if you like, and we went down... I met them and all the rest of it, photographs taken. It was just incredible seeing them. Mm. You know, they're still there, the same guys, and they still do the same music. And uh, the crowd, you know, they all stand up and go mad. So it's fantastic. But Diane did have a complaint, didn't she? Um, that they were sat down all night. She did have a complaint that they were sat down all night because the stage were known to really, you know, get together and sort of it's one to one standing up and all the sort of thing they do with the guitars and all that and they just sat down in front they're like old farts you know and well, they playing are. their old music they are old farts but the audience all stood up and went quite mad <laughs> but then you look around the audience the age of the audience is, is like 50 plus you know yeah. that was that was the strangest thing of all writing I'm very very involved with writing books and I say I'm in the middle of the third book and the third book is based upon the first book, which is my autobi autobiography, and plugging the book, it's called Sex and Violins, which is available on Amazon and so on. And a very good read. And a very, oh, thank you. A very right. good read. And it's really, everybody said about that book, who said that you've got pictures of artists in that book that you've produced, how these artists were found, and what you've produced them, but what are the stories behind all those productions? The dirt. And it's all the dirt. Yeah, yeah that's and what people want. The dirt. Back so I'm now writing the dirt, <laughs> and it's called Blind Faith. <laughs> it's called 
Blind Faith. Okay. Temporarily. I don't know if it will be the tra- title of the book, but at the moment it's Blind Faith. Right. And it's amazing that I've got to... I'm writing it in the third person. Not in the first person. Right. But in the third person. And thought it of a name for myself. But I've got to get new, new names for all these people that have appeared out through my career, you say. <clears throat> I mean, what do I call the status quo, you know? It's pretty hard when you're writing... In the Latest name. Poe? Well, yeah, yeah. I'd be welcome for any ideas. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, just, just thinking about me, John, I'll, I'll come up with something silly for you. Okay. Why can't you use the real names? Because, um, what's, the, what's the legal term of this when you're... No, it's not passing off. It's something that you're... You know, you might be telling a story about somebody who's still alive that is may not be true, or may be true, and they don't want it to be heard. You it know, could be libelous. It could be libelous. And I certainly don't want to get anywhere near anything that is libelous. So, you know, I'm writing in you know, different names. With everybody in this book is different names. And here's um, the online and, confession. Yeah, the big question... <laughs> the puzzle at the end of the book is... Guess who the names are? <laughs> you <Yeah>. see, <laughs> you should make them all anagrams. Yeah, well, and then you could have like an anagram puzzle at the back of the book. That would be brilliant. I know. You yeah, know, but it's quite fun doing it. You know, I think, oh my god, you know, what, what it was to produce to get that band, and the, even the Samandi story is is incredible. Mm. Everybody knows Samandi, but what happened before Samandi, and and the leading up to uh, the first sessions with them, and what went with. You know, it's quite incredible. Sam Kelly, you can call him Kelly Sampson. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. And they went to the stage, didn't they? And yep. They supported Al Green, and uh, I mean, fantastic. They had a fantastic career so far, and I'm really, really pleased that they they get together now, and they're a fourth album. Mm. And when they're playing on stage, they're all sort of, dare I say, somewhere near my age, but they still look about 25 years old. Quite amazing.